Dear Keisha, think positive thoughts and you may heal more quickly than you thought possible. We miss you and we want you better. Miss White's fourth grade class. Signed, Kimmy Lee, the only Korean girl in my class. <laughs> John Lyons, the hottest fourth grader there was. Two Lisas, neither of them had a last name. <laughs> and finally, Timothy, who just drew a dick. <laughs> As the sick kid, you have boxes of letters like these lying at home. Clap it up if you've ever signed a Get Well Soon card. <laughs> It's not as sincere as you mean, and we know, we sick kids know. You see, I was born sick, and I've struggled every day of my life to be healthy. I mean, last year, I didn't even make it to SoloCon 2014 because of Ebola. <laughs> yes. Don't be racist. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to you. <laughs> now, you may think, Keisha, how could you get Ebola? You don't spend your weekends picking wild flowers in Sierra Leone and making out with villagers. No, 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 I do not. I was sick last year, and I missed my solo comp show called Nia Presents Africa. America's favorite country, total joke. Get it? Because Africa's not a country, it's a continent. I'm not explaining, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I missed it because I woke up November 14th with a stiff neck and a fever. Not feeling good. I work on a college campus, so I'm around college students all the time, and I'm sorry if you are one, but you're nasty. Yes. <laughs> and make out with everything. <laughs> but I did what any sensible American would do, feeling feverish, stiff neck, headache, and I went to work anyway. <laughs> because I knew in 48 hours I was about to have the biggest gig of my life. I was about to make thousands of dollars for minutes of my time. I'm an improviser. That matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back to bed and I was exhausted. I was sweaty. And I went to bed and I woke up this time with my husband next to me urging me to go to the emergency room as a rational person would do. And I said, no. I'm going to sit up, and I did, and I started crying. Oh. And then I got in that shower, and I cried. <laughs> and I put on my clothes, and I cried. And I walked out that door, got halfway down the street, and I burst into tears in front of a bodega and said, no, I'm going back home and going to sleep. And I did. And there, my husband, Andrew, he said, if you're not better in the next couple of days, in the next couple of hours, I, I'm going to make you go to the hospital. And I hate hospitals because if you're a sick kid, you know that there are some amazing doctors out there that will save your life. And you also know that there are some assholes who don't <laughs> give a shit about their job and aren't intentionally trying to kill you, but they might kill you. <laughs> <laughs> So I laid there for two hours and the pain got too much. My fever climbed too high and my husband Andrew said, we're going to urgent care. Because urgent care is a step below the ER. It feels less emergency, more urgent. <laughs> it was 2014, so I'll bring you back. Ebola was trendy. We should fear Africans in the street coughing and spitting on us. That was the climate, if you don't remember. <laughs> so I walk into urgent care, and I see a banner that says, Ebola, beware. And on the receptionist's desk, there's just pamphlets speckling with Ebola madness. Do you have Ebola? Could this be Ebola? Are you nauseous? Are you bleeding? 
And my husband and I are looking and we tend to think there's a lot of hyperbole around this Ebola scare. I mean, let's be honest, only two people, I think, in America died. It could have been one, but I'm going to say two for safety. <laughs> <laughs> died in America of Ebola, and they weren't even Americans, so good job us. <laughs> <laughs> and sitting behind the desk, I come in at my feverish, and I say, I, I need to see a doctor, and she says, what brings you here? Ebola? <laughs> <laughs> she asked me, have I been to Africa in the last 30 days? To which I say, no, I would love to go, but I couldn't. <laughs> she asked me, are you sure you don't have Ebola? <laughs> to which my husband and I snarkily laugh and say, no. I'm pretty sure it's meningitis. No. And then I'm ushered to the corner of the waiting room, given a mask, because how dare I infect anyone. And we sit there for about five to ten minutes, laughing at all this Ebola madness. And we're brought back into an examination room where a very nice man behind the computer asked me, do you have Ebola? <laughs> have you been to Africa in the last 30 days? Are you sure you don't have Ebola? To which I say no, a little less snarky. And my husband and I were like, this is funny. I'm in pain and could die because meningitis kills people. I don't know if you know this. Uh, it's, a bac it's a bacterial or viral infection that infiltrates your spinal fluid and wreaks havoc. Mm -hmm. I wait another 20 minutes and the doctor comes in and she says, what brings you here today? And I say, well, I have a fever, I have headaches, my neck is incredibly stiff. It reminds me of when I had viral meningitis in college. I was a nasty college student, so <laughs> I <laughs> And she says, are you sure you don't have a boulder? <laughs> have you been to Africa in the last few days? Are you sure you don't have a boulder? And I say, no, there's no way I could have a boulder. I live in New York. And she says, well, listen, if it is meningitis, there's nothing we can do for you here. You have to get a spinal tap. So I do the best thing I know how, and I go to Harlem Hospital, which is the best hospital if you've been shot or stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk in, and there's a bigger boulder banner that says, Ebola is a thing. And there's pamphlets everywhere, and a sassy nurse behind the, I'm sorry, a sassy receptionist behind the counter just talking up the storm, and before I open my mouth, and he says, do you have Ebola? <laughs> no. Are you sure you don't have Ebola? <laughs> yes. Have you been to Africa in the last 30 days? <laughs> no, I have not been to Africa in the last 30 days. I'm in excruciating pain because of my neck, and it's probably meningitis. I work at a campus. Can someone help me? And he goes, oh. Meningitis. I had that once and had to get a spinal tap. It was the most excruciating, devastating pain of my life. I wanted to die when they stuck that needle in my spine. It was awful. Two minutes go by of him describing it. <laughs> His meningitis was, meanwhile, I am not getting any help. And I say, that's great. Please, can you help me? I'm given a facial mask and taken back very quickly to triage where I am again asked, do you have Ebola? No. Are you sure it's not Ebola? No. <laughs> I have meningitis, I think. Someone please help me. So I'm brought back into my own room where this picture was taken. If you see in that, that corner, that's the picture of Africa. The CDC put monitors in hospitals to make sure everybody knew that a bullet is a thing or people die of the flu. So it's true. I hate to bring the real stuff, but that's true. And that does.
doctor came in and he asked, do you have Ebola? Have you been to Africa in the last 30 days? Are you sure you don't have Ebola? And when I said no, I think it's meningitis. I did not get a spinal tap. I did not get help. I was sent home. And if you think that's anticlimactic, it's because it was. <laughs> <laughs> and so I laid in bed for three days with a fever, stiff neck, not being able to do a goddamn thing because of Ebola, and I missed it. SoloCon 2014. When you're a sick kid, you're used to a lot of anticlimactic things. You see, I was born a sick kid. When my mom was pregnant with me and her water broke, she noticed merconium in her water, which merconium is baby fecal matter, which is AKA baby shit. So I was born literally swimming around in my own baby shit. Do not feel sorry for me, I am here. <laughs> <laughs> I, because of complications of a birth defect, I remember playing in my grandparents' living room with brown shag carpeting. And I remember standing up with my pink pant and a blood stain right here, because I was born with a broken vagina. I am not kidding. I had a prolapse urethra, and one in 3,000 people has it. Someone you love probably has it. And I keep going. Because when you're the sick kid, you have no other option. Most of the time you think of the sick kid, yeah, that was the fourth grade. Sometimes they live. I am an example of <laughs> I remember being in dance class, going up on my toes and breaking my foot because of osteoporosis. The thing that's hard is like, I had ulcerative colitis. And if you know Latin or are a doctor, you know that's like I had ulcers in my cough, like my colon. And I got very sick. I used to be a big girl. I used to be 200 plus pounds. So stop telling me, oh, but you look good now. Fuck you. <laughs> but I used to be a big girl. And I, I loved it until I got so sick when I was 16 years old. My colon was literally rotting inside of me. Blood, pus. I was in the hospital and I couldn't move because I was in so much pain. I was on the highest dose of morphine. So high that I hallucinated that the blinds were talking to me. <laughs> uh, what they were saying, I do not remember. <laughs> I just remember they were, they were gabbing away. And I'm holding my parents' hands and that's when I have my movie moment. The doctor burst in. And he says, we're going to remove that colon. You're going to get your total colectomy in hours. And he sits my parents and I down, and he's like, this surgery will be 10 hours long. You'll have to be on antibiotics, potentially for the rest of your life. You'll have an ostomy bag. You'll go through two other surgeries, and you'll never be able to have anal sex. <laughs> Wow. 
well, and I wake up with tubes in my nose, in my mouth, and my <laughs> vagina, and my butthole was literally sewn shut. And for the first time in years, I was in a little less pain than I had. And I slept for what felt like hours, maybe days, I don't know. And I awoke. The TV was on. My dad was standing over me, almost in tears, holding back emotion. And he shook me and said, Princess Diane is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I warned my virginal butthole. <laughs> <laughs> when you're the sick kid, <laughs> you're used to people telling you what to do all the time. That health is a choice. You know, you wouldn't be sick if you just like ate better. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Explainers. Do not tell me how to eat. I go out to dinner with you and you're like, I wouldn't order that if I was you. Uh, Fuck you. <laughs> I almost died once because I drank table water. I had a glass of table water that was infected with bacteria that probably won't kill you but could kill me. And I was doing a skinny bitch Jesus medium show. If you know them, they're a great sketch comedy group. I was in the middle of the show and I started bleeding out of my ass. <laughs> So trust me when I say I know my story. <laughs> I struggle with my health every day. And in the last 12 months, I've taken it upon myself to say, yes, I'm a sick kid. Yes, I have invisible disabilities, and that's okay. And the only thing I would say is if you're out there and you want to chat with me about all the things I've been through, that's great. Just don't tell me how to live my life. Don't be an asshole, because I'm too busy worrying about mine. <laughs> <laughs>